welcome to the stage our moderator, Mr. Brian Dempsey from Wounded Warrior Project. Good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? Am I on? We're live. All right, good morning. Uh, my name is Brian Dempsey. I'm the Government Affairs Director for Wounded Warrior Project. Um, I'm joined by some great uh, friends and colleagues from this space here who I'll introduce shortly. But figure uh, a good and natural way to start off would just be to tell you a little bit about Wounded Warrior Project um, and how we've gotten this opportunity right here. Um, we were founded in 2003 with a mission to honor and empower wounded warriors. We are focused specifically on helping out the post 9-11 generation and get to do so in three um, distinct but related ways. Uh, we offer free programs and services across the country to wounded warriors, their families, and their caregivers. Uh, we're also fortunate to be here in Washington where we're advocating for public policies to better the lives of our veteran and military community. And I think kind of to the point where we're in front of you today is one of the uh, things that we're fortunate to do is be able to um, partner and help fund other organizations in this space that are doing tremendous work across the country. Uh, one of our long partner and current partners here is Hill Vets uh, and all the fantastic work that they're doing here in Washington, D.C. and how we've uh, gotten up here this morning. Um, it's been an exciting year for the partnership. We actually welcomed our first fellow to our government and community relations team. Kirsten Laha Walsh, I think I saw her uh, in the room, but she may have stepped out right now, but she's been doing fantastic work. I think a great testament to the uh, wonderful people that the Hill Vets team has brought in, in addition to all the work that Justin, um, Betty, Jody, and the rest of the team have done to put on a great Capcom series uh, the last couple of days here. So um, to kind of bring us up back and, and jump into the panel, I wanted to rewind uh, exactly two weeks ago, actually, when my team was brainstorming about this opportunity to speak to you today and how we could uh, fit this theme of recruit, retain, reinvent to a discussion around advocacy. You know, the work that we're doing to lobby uh, policymakers, to um, increase public education around the issues that matter, and to uh, you know, really keep that steady drumbeat to keep these issues front of mind to those who are making decisions here in Washington and across the country. Um, and I think it really presented uh, a great opportunity to look at this in a linear way, right? How do we identify and advocate for opportunities that are going to inspire people to serve, to stay in service, and to have you know, good things to share about their time in uniform and after transition uh, into the civilian world? And it was almost serendipitous timing in that I went back to my desk that day, and uh, that morning, the New York Times, uh, Dave Phillips had published an article uh, titled, With Few Able and Fewer Willing, U.S. Military Can't Find Recruits. And I took two things away from that article uh, that sat with me and I think sort of committed our interest in having a panel around this today. One factual, that being that the armed forces are experiencing large shortfalls in enlistments uh, this year and recruitment is on pace to be uh, its worst since just after the Vietnam War. But the other insight, which I thought to be a bit more reflective and hopeful, uh, was the story of an Army recruiter mentioned throughout the article uh, and his personal account uh, of enlisting and how, essentially, as a recruiter, and he really believed in what he was selling because of his experience in the military. And it was you know, through his eyes as a 31-year-old living in North Carolina, uh, picking up extra ships at a warehouse uh, to take care of his three kids to then find himself a year later uh, working on Apache helicopters, um, having his housing paid for, and a plan for his own education after service. I thought it was really inspiring and encouraging to uh, hear that perspective as sort of the front lines in the recruitment process. Um, and as we were talking about it a little bit more, the insights uh, brought to mind a quote to kind of recenter us here and move forward into the panel. I'm going to read off here. And that's the willingness with which our young people are likely to serve in any war, no matter how justified, shall be directly proportional as to how they perceive the veterans of earlier wars were treated and appreciated by their nation. And that's been attributed to uh, George Washington most often, but uh, former Senator and President Barack Obama, uh, John McCain have also been quoted. I also thought it might be fun to put a giant quote up there put big marks around it, put my own name under it, like in full Michael Scott fashion. But uh, well, we're going to sit with uh, President Washington's remarks, and I think they're, they're a good uh, <clears throat> grounding point to dive in right here. 
uh, about how we treat and appreciate, right? How, um, how we can address these through the lens of advocacy, uh, which lets us entertain questions like what policies we can pursue as a community, how we can inform and inspire as we raise awareness about what it means to serve. So uh, to help bring context to this conversation and some real world examples, I'm joined by three wonderful and talented panelists here to my left here. Jen Goodale, the Director of Military and Family Policy and Spouse Programs at the Military Officers Association of America. I might slip and just call it MOA, but that's the military officers. <laughs> uh, Lauren Augusty, the Vice President of Government Affairs at Student Veterans of America. And my dear friend and colleague, Alex Morosky, the Deputy Director of Government Affairs at Wounded Warrior Project. Um, and before we jump into some questions, I'd invite each of you to just introduce yourself personally, maybe talk about the branch of service you were in, the issues that you work in your day-to-day -day job, and then we'll jump into it a little bit more. Excellent. Thanks, Brian, and thank you, Hill Vets, for having us today. Um, as Brian mentioned, I'm Jennifer Goodale with the Military Officers Association of America. I um, primarily handle anything that touches the military family, which includes child care, spouse programs, or spouse employment, um, K-12 education, and housing. Um, my connection to the military is that I have served in the active duty Marine Corps from 2002 to 2009, and I've been a military spouse almost twice as long, um, coming up on 14 years, so my husband's still active duty Marine Corps. Hi, I'm Lauren Augustine, the Vice President of Government Affairs with Student Veterans of America. As our name suggests, our policy focus is primarily on VA education services, and um, we also do work with higher education issues more broadly, talking about access, portability, and making sure that we're providing quality education for taxpayer money. Um, my military service, I was uh, active in the Army. I flew drones for the Army for a while, and I've been a veteran advocate since for the last decade. Um, so prior to SCA, I also worked mental health issues, healthcare access, and the like. Um, and I'm very thankful to Brian and Hill Vets for having me here today. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Alex Morosky, uh, Deputy Director of Government Affairs at Wounded Warrior Project, which Brian's already introduced our organization. Uh, my military connection is that I joined the Army uh, right out of high school. I enlisted as an infantryman in the year 2000. I was stationed in Germany. Uh, deployed to Kosovo uh, with that unit. Uh, shortly after 9-11 happened, uh, I re-enlisted and uh, was stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky in the 101st Airborne. Uh, I was in the invasion of Iraq in 2003. I deployed a second time to Iraq in 2006. Um, my vehicle was hit by an IED during my second tour, and I was wounded along with two other soldiers. Um, and I tell you this story because I was medevac to Landstuhl where I received a backpack that had toiletries and clean socks in it, um, and that's how I learned about Wounded Warrior Project for the very first time. So uh, fast forward, I guess, 16 years. I'm now on the government affairs team for Wounded Warrior Project, and I've been primarily handling toxic exposure issues, which for our population deals with exposure to burn pits in Iraq and Afghanistan. And... Uh, the cancers and the respiratory issues that go along with that and the trouble that those uh, veterans have accessing their VA health care and benefits. Um. Great. Thanks, Alex. And um, I wanted to segue into our conversation and tell you a little bit about myself, actually, before uh, leaning over to Jen here, um, in that I came to Wounded Warrior Project after uh, serving as an attorney at the Department of Veterans Affairs for about three years, uh, in part through my own personal obligation I felt to give back to those who served because I did not. I grew up in suburban New Jersey um, in an area where I, I've since learned uh, is one of the lowest per capita states for enlistment purposes. Um, most of what I knew about the military was from watching TVs and movies, stuff like uh, Full Metal Jacket and A Few Good Men and things that don't necessarily give you a, a full you know, spectrum and perspective of what it means other than, you know, sleeping in a bunk bed in a barracks. Um, but nevertheless, um, you know, it, I was, I think, a good example of someone who might have been harder to reach at a certain uh, time and place. Um, so with that, I wanted to ask you, Jen, uh, MOA is one of the most engaged service organizations on military matters. Uh, can you start off this conversation by giving us an overview of the current recruiting landscape and maybe 
tell us a little bit more about what's driving people to serve these days and what are some of the current challenges in military recruitment? Absolutely. All right. Brian already alluded to this in that New York Times article that he talked about before, but recruitment is a significant issue right now and retention rates are, are abysmal. Um, and primarily for the recruitment side, that's because only of the eligible serving age population only 24 could even qualify to serve. And a much, much smaller percentage of that is willing to raise their hand and commit to service. Um, and and that's, there's many reasons for that, whether it's the way that um, the withdrawal from Afghanistan impacted that, the current conflicts in Ukraine, and the treatment of uh, service members, veterans, and their families is all impacting that. Because the good news travels don't, the, the good news stories don't travel well the bad stories that happen, the housing issues that families are facing with constant mold um, and other issues that the military doesn't seem to be addressing very well, those are the stories that go viral and that impacts um, willingness to serve, willingness to stay in the service if your spouse can't retain a job, those types of things contribute to it. So I think service, all the services are going to face shortages this year um, and something has to be done to address it. Of course. Um, so, Jen, I think what your, you know, conversation leads us towards is some of those issues from a military perspective, right? But at the end of the day, it really is a individual decision-making process, sort of weighing the pros and cons, looking at what your vision for your own career and future is going to look like. Um, and, you know, that really brings us around to a question I have for you, Lauren, um, you know, around the decision-making process for those who do enlist. And I think that, you know, SVA, which, you know, you're founded in 2008 amidst the growth of veteran and military service organizations um, established after September 11th, uh, but you've truly found a way to stand out by focusing on higher education. Uh, I think that the GI Bill uh, may very well be one of the best-known benefits associated with uh, life after transition. So shifting gears here a bit, how are SVA and others speaking about what awaits someone after they serve, and is that pitched differently depending on the audiences that you're talking to? Yeah, thank you. So um, as Jen said, good news stories are hard to travel, and at SVA, we really take to heart the need to share the good news stories about student veterans and the educated veteran population as a whole. Uh, and as a, as a reason to serve, it's probably one of the most you know, prevalent reasons somebody chooses to serve and one of the most well-known benefits, as you said, among the general population. And we really take that ownership and, and take it to heart when we speak about the GI Bill, when we speak about student veterans and their potential. And when we think about that messaging and the role we play in sharing that message, we have five main audiences that we keep in mind. The first is the student themselves. So we speak about student veterans as the ambassador of the all-volunteer force. They are on college campuses with students who may be eligible and interested in join, joining the military. And we make sure that student veterans know that they have that, that, that hold on the story that they, their service may bring to a college campus. We also want them to be empowered to be good leaders on campus across the board. So Nick, who was out here earlier, great example, right, a student over at Georgetown, is such a great ambassador of student veterans as a whole and the potential for military service, and we want that story told on campus. Another audience we have is the VA, so the GI Bill is oftentimes one of the first benefits a veteran will access when they leave service, and so we try to pivot the conversation to the GI Bill being the front door to the VA, and if we can get the services right for the GI Bill and students using the GI Bill, we have created a customer for life for the VA and a story that veterans are more likely to share. Yes, you're treated well when you leave service if they start on a good foot and continue on good, a good footing with the VA. So that's another audience that we try to keep in mind. Um, a third that we have are the schools. So there was a time uh, many, many decades ago where student veterans were not viewed favorably by school administrators. And um, you know, when the original GI Bill was passed in the 1940s, there was this massive concern among school administrators that they would be overrun with horrible students who weren't going to do well on their college campuses. And nothing could be farther from the truth then or now. And so we make sure that school administrators are really aware of and bought into the good news story of student veterans. They are more likely to succeed on campus. They're more likely to lead on campus. They're more likely to graduate. All things school administrators want to hear and care about. So we make sure that that's a part of the story. Um, 
And then uh, the fourth one, employers. So on that back end, making sure, again, that the good news story of an educated veteran population is told, understood, and well-known. Again, more likely to graduate, more likely to have intangible skills that employers really like. Making sure that is known and appreciated is so important uh, to give the good news story about veterans. And the last, this is a new one for us, but we're really excited about it. The state level is something that is an emerging conversation that we're having, and a lot of states are aware of the challenges with recruiting, particularly among National Guard, and retaining talent within states. And so one of the things that we've been encouraging states to consider is this idea that you should allow students, high school students who graduate and then join the military right away to come back to your state and have a deferred enrollment to state colleges. That way we're ensuring we have a pipeline of recruitment. We're also ensuring we have a pipeline of educated veterans who then go on to those employers. Um, so it's really a, a comprehensive approach to how we tell that story. And that was a long answer. And I appreciate everybody sticking with me for it. <laughs> No, Lauren, I love it. You always speak with such an optimistic and hopeful tone <coughs> when talking about these issues. And, you know, in some ways, I, I think what the narrative brings us to is an ideal scenario for many, right? Um, you know, the, the fun and interesting military career, the pride in service and camaraderie, but of course, enlisting has its risks. Um, the prospects of injuries loom and are a very real possibility for some, uh, but as a backstop to that is a promise that a grateful nation will do everything it can to make a wounded warrior whole again. So Alex, I want to turn the conversation over to you, uh, representing Wounded Warrior Project. Can you speak on what that promise means, and then perhaps using recent events as a segue back to advocacy, how VA healthcare continues to evolve to meet the needs of those who served? Yeah, sure, Brian. And I think the, uh, the George Washington quote really applies here, if we can attribute it to George Washington. Um, yeah, like you said, um, I think that when young people consider joining the military, they do so with some understanding that there are risks involved. I mean, I know I did, but uh, we as a country make a promise to people who serve in the military that if they get injured in some way, that there will be health care and benefits and support for them uh, when they come home. And this is accomplished in large part through the Department of Veterans Affairs. There's the Veterans Benefits Administration and the Veterans Health Administration. Uh, VHA in particular, we're talking about 171 hospitals na nationwide, over 1,000 clinics, 9.3 million uh, enrollees that they serve. And so uh, in that way, we are keeping the promise for many veterans. But still, we're always looking for where are the gaps. Um, and, and one of the places that there have been, you know, a gap identified for our generation, cer certainly, just like there were for previous generations, is for veterans who suffered toxic exposures. Uh, we see it with the Vietnam generation with Agent Orange, and we see it with our generation as well uh, with burn pit exposure, that this country is very good at recognizing physical wounds. And we've gotten a lot better at recognizing mental wounds. But we still have a long way to go in recognizing toxic wounds. Um, one of the reasons for that is because toxic injuries don't always manifest in service. Sometimes they manifest years later. And then when a veteran goes to the VA and tries to get treated or tries to get benefits for cancer or respiratory condition, they're told that they can't prove that their service caused this. Uh, and so because of this, uh, if we go back to the Vietnam generation, Congress has enacted a series of laws that creates a fair process for Vietnam veterans to access their health care and benefits called the Agent Orange Act. Uh, we recognized as a community, as an organization and as a community, that the current generation uh, needs policies to create a fair process for them too. And this really became a priority uh, several years ago. When we all came together, we formed coalitions, some formally. There was the Toxic Exposure in the American Military, or Team Coalition, which we helped uh, found. There's also informal coalitions of other groups, and you know, we work, we've worked with MOA, we've worked with SBA. Um, and we came together and we came up with a series of policy solutions uh, for what would create a fair process for veterans. And some of these things include guaranteed access to health care for everyone who is exposed so that no one gets turned away uh, when these issues arise. Uh, conceding that the exposure occurred in the first place because oftentimes veterans are asked, well, can you prove that you were, uh, that you worked next to a burn pit? And of course, these aren't the kind of things that are in military records. Creating a list of presumptive conditions so that a veteran doesn't necessarily have to prove that their lung cancer was caused by smoke inhalation. This, we know that smoke inhalation causes lung cancer, so we're able to grant that claim. Uh, and other things as well. Uh, and so, 
we as a, as a community took these uh, solutions to Congress. Uh, many bills were introduced over the 117th Congress. There were roundtables. Uh, there were hearings that we testified at. Uh, and then these bills were eventually put together into a comprehensive package uh, that became the, what we call the Honoring Our Pact Act. Uh, and that's really uh, the bill that, we're all, that we've all been pushing ever since. Um, grassroots advocacy. Um, you know, pushing out action alerts to our members, having them contact their senators and, and their representatives. Um, you know, there's public awareness and, and, and media campaigns, uh, you know, to get the word out about this. Um, and then, you know, just the old-fashioned sort of uh, shoe leather uh, advocacy where we walk the halls of Congress and we meet with any congressional office that has concerns about this legislation because it's a big bill. Um, and we try to see if we can, uh, you know, alleviate the, their concerns. And then there's also working with VA and getting buy-in from VA, and the VA secretaries endorse the bill as well. Uh, you know, so we're very hopeful that this bill uh, will get passed, we hope, before uh, Congress leaves for its August recess. Um, the House has already passed it. The Senate has actually already passed it as well, but it had to go back to the House, and there was a technical issue that had to be fixed. Uh, it's now back with the Senate. We were hoping that maybe the Senate uh, would advance it yesterday, um, but uh, that, that, that didn't happen. But nonetheless, we're going to keep at it, uh, and I'm very hopeful um, that we're going to get this bill passed uh, and keep the promise to veterans with toxic wounds. Thanks, Alex. I you know, appreciate the uh, overview of current legislation, specific legislation, to really kind of help frame this. So, Jen, I want to come back to you, actually. You are, I know you already started touching on a few of these topics. Um, but when we come back to those policies in the community that they've been pursuing you know, sort of on the military front, um, what's really been going on in the military space? What's been amplified over the last few years that are really standing out, not just for uh, individuals uh, in uniform necessarily, but also, you know, the, the household unit? Um, yeah. what, what is, what's well been working on? What else has been going on in the space? Thanks, Brian. Um, I love an opportunity to talk about my portfolio. So <laughs> the... The old phrase is you recruit the individual, you retain the family. And so DOD has done a lot of good work to try to, to put it together programs that help military spouses find jobs to address the child care issue. In fact, they just recently um, implemented the in-home care program, which helps um, not only dual working couples, but especially dual military couples who need off-hour support and things like that. Unfortunately, some of these very well-intentioned programs don't work. And so that's where advocates and the grassroots advocacy, I'm so glad you said that, Alex. When, when we put forward, um, when we're working on legislation, we always put out a call to action. And we, we push that out to everyone. And it's to, to educate. Because I, I think I was telling these guys in the back room that I speak to 21-year-olds all day, every day, trying to explain why military spouses struggle to find employment. Um, and even, even the 30-year-old the who says, I don't understand why you had trouble finding a job. I said, well, I've moved six times in 13 years. Uh, it's, it's, they, don't, they just don't know any better. So that's where um, spreading the message and not just telling it as a bad news story. I had a great experience in the Marine Corps. I would, I would have stayed in um, forever, but we kind of made a family decision that I would get out, and I love being still a part of it. So we have to share all of the, the good things that are happening, and then we have to talk with Congress about ensuring that they don't just put out good ideas that are good on paper and don't actually impact the families the way that they are intended. Um, and so some of the things in the child care space, that in-home care, where they're also expanding the military child care in your neighborhood to try to get child care resources outside the gates for those um, families that can't get on the, into the CDC. And in the spouse employment front, we're trying to add military spouses as a target group under the Work Opportunity Tax Credit. And that credit was established back in 96. It's evolved over time. It offers um, tax credits to employers who hire ex-felons, qualified veterans, SNAP recipients, and then seven other groups that I don't remember the names of. Um, but we just want that to, to add military spouses. This has been around since 2005. The legislation has originally started in 2005, and it still hasn't been passed yet. So um, would appreciate all of you visiting the MOA website and, and sending a letter to your lawmakers. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Um, Lauren, I want to come back to you and kind of revisit a conversation we had a laugh over the other day when planning through the panel. Um, 
and that's revisiting the conversation about the forever GI Bill. You know, how big legislation can have this enduring quality uh, and sort of the memory bank of ours who are advocates here, but uh, how effective advocacy doesn't always stop at success, uh, but continues by maintaining, you know, expert knowledge and awareness of the space that you're working in. Um, so what's your process personally for keeping up momentum on issues as they come across your, your desk? And what observations have you made in your career about how organizations can be successful when pursuing their policy agendas? Yeah, great question. Thank you. So yeah, um, for SVA, for the veteran community at large, Forever GI Bill was such a great moment of coalition and momentum and just a lot of goodwill and good effort, good work that finally came to something that is having a meaningful impact on the veteran community for forever, which is really exciting. Um, I often get asked, you know, do you think they're going to shrink the GI Bill again now that you know, we're out of Iraq and Afghanistan, that's sort of the general cadence of the GI Bill, and I say, no, we took care of that, do not worry, we are all set, which is really nice to be able to share. Uh, but to your point, what has been more important than Forever GI Bill is making sure that we haven't let up on that steam, on that pressure, and ensuring that we are continuing to refine and find ways to, to implement new ways of, of empowering student veterans and, and everybody else using VA educational benefits so that we're capitalizing on that work and making sure that we're continuing to grow the potential of the GI Bill. So some great examples of that. Um, I think I use the word nitpicky. We've been able to get nitpicky about the GI Bill um, and what it can give to students. And a, a great example of that, there's this problem with the GI Bill, I'm gonna call it a problem, where you can't really study abroad. Uh, you can, but it requires very specific pathways, very specific intentions, and none of that aligns with how higher education actually functions with study abroad. And we have the flexibility now that we've handled some of these really marquee problems with the GI Bill to go in and say, wait a minute, fix this problem for study abroad students because it is a really important part of education pathways. And there's a dozen other examples uh, of things like study abroad that we're focusing on. And what it allows is for the Hill and for other advocates to sort of understand the breadth of issues that are available to work on uh, on the education front and really get involved with that. We were building on that coalition, building on that goodwill, uh, which leads into the second part of your question, um, how can you be successful? One, uh, I think it's just being a really fair and kind actor with your fellow advocates, um, and, and that includes Hill staff and, and, and members of Congress, and so just being honest and kind will go a really long way over a long period of time. Um, you know, my boss, Jared, and I often talk about the importance of being kind for the long game. Um, you can get a lot done really quickly uh, if you are, are really aggressive about that, and that's needed sometimes. It's an absolutely, absolutely valuable strategy. Uh, but for the long game, for having the sustained success over time, you have to be easy to work with um, and in kind when you're doing that. So that's a critical part of it. The other critical part of it is building coalitions and, and maintaining those friendships because in this space in particular, we are all very close and we work together for years and maintaining that, that esprit de corps amongst ourselves and making sure that we can then pick up the phone and call on each other when things go really bad, when we're, at, we're in sort of the trenches of something, uh, is how we make sure that one success you know, leads to more success, even across different portfolios. So those are my, my two big things. Be kind and, and be a good friend. Uh, Alex, <laughs> before we, uh, before we you know, wrap this up, I want to give you a final maybe opportunity to talk to that coalition aspect. I know they can take, you know, a, fall anywhere on the spectrum, whether they be, you know, with groups that have a small local presence to national organizations, groups that are focused narrowly on specific issues and others who are able to open a much broader portfolio. Um, what other thoughts might you have to add to the, uh, the power behind building coalitions across the VSO, MSO space and, and making a good advocacy campaign? Sure. Well, first of all, I concur with everything that Lauren <laughs> said. You've got to be a good friend. That's a good way of putting it. I mean, coalitions are absolutely critical. Um, I was talking about the Honoring Our PACT Act. I don't know how we get this far on a bill like the Honoring Our PACT Act without coalition work. And coalitions can be formal like the team coalition or the military coalition, TMC, or they can be informal, we call them tiger teams, groups of organizations that get together and, you know, on the Honoring Our PACT Act, we worked with MOA, we worked with uh, VFW, the American Legion, DAV, others, um, informally. Um, and uh, I'll also mention, in the case of the Honoring Our PACT Act, uh, a very prominent member of our coalition is uh, John Stewart, 
formerly of The Daily Show and, and now The Problem with Jon Stewart. Um, he did some advocacy work, did a lot of advocacy work uh, with 9-11 first responders and helping them get health care and benefits for their toxic exposures. And when he learned about the issue that veterans were having uh, with toxic exposures, uh, he jumped right into it. Um, and he's been with us uh, pretty much every step of the way. And, you know, when it comes to his ability to bring public awareness on an issue, um, it's just, it, it, you can't say how valuable it is. So if you're building a coalition and you know a celebrity, I highly recommend that you involve them in your coalition because it really helps. Um, but, you know, the importance of coalitions, I think, is really twofold. Uh, number one, it's that different organizations represent different groups of veterans, and so they can bring different experiences to bear on the issue, and they can help each other, uh, you know, not only sharpen their own ideas, but also make sure that every veteran is included in the solution that needs to be. Um, and then also you help create consensus, the, the right way for the community to move forward. Because when you have a community of different organizations that are all saying the answer to this problem is this, and they're all different, then different members of Congress will latch on to different solutions, um, and then there will be sort of confusion on the right way forward, and then you risk that really nothing gets done in the end. So it's very important uh, that a community speaks with one voice on big issues. And then there's just you know, the logistical side of, of organizing the advocacy efforts, you know, organizing so that action alerts go out at the same time, or organizing, you know, we held rallies across the country for the PACT Act. Wounded Warrior Project did one at our headquarters in Jacksonville, but, you know, VFW did one in Kansas City, Legion in Indianapolis, DAV in Kentucky, and we were able to coordinate these because we were all uh, talking to each other as part of this coalition, or something, uh, you know, as simple as, as a day on the hill. Um, the day before the last uh, Senate vote on the PACT Act, we hit all 100 Senate offices in one day. There's no way that one organization can do that. It takes a coalition to do something like that. So uh, coalition work certainly uh, very critical. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Alex. And I think, you know, coalition building speaks a lot to, you know, the organizational and community uh, approach to, that we have to a lot of the work that we do together. But uh, as we close out the panel here, I was just hoping to invite each of you to maybe bring up a favorite memory of working as an advocate in this community, whether it be a specific bill you worked on, a special memory, or just something that's a bit more personal to each of you. So, uh, Alex, why don't we start with you, and then we'll work our way back down. I think my most memorable experience, uh, I came to Capitol Hill in, uh, as, a, as a VSO advocate in 2013, um, and I remember the first time that I ever testified uh, in a committee hearing. It was a House Veterans Affairs Committee hearing. Um, I remember uh, walking into the room being very nervous, uh, sitting down at the witness table. I remember... Uh, turning the microphone on, saying, good, mor good morning, Mr. Chairman, and then I think I blacked out for about 30 seconds. I actually don't even remember what I was testifying on, but when I came to, uh, you know, halfway through my opening statement, um, you know, I kind of had the feeling, I wonder if anybody knows that uh, I don't belong here. But, uh, you know, as it turns out, uh, we do belong there. You know, veterans and veteran service organizations do belong in these hearings, uh, communicating to Congress uh, what the issues are for veterans. Uh, but yeah, my, my first uh, hearing was a very memorable experience for me. That's a good one. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Um, I will share a specific bill. Um, and I went back and forth. I've, I've had the good fortune of working on a number of really fun bills, but one that I think I will carry with me for the rest of my life, um, actually a COVID bill. Uh, when COVID first hit, March 2020, we saw this mass closure of schools and moving online. And we started getting calls and emails from students saying, hey, will my, will my tuition be affected? Will my housing be affected? And my team went onto the VA website. We saw on there, if you've been in person class one day and then you move online, you, your housing won't be affected. You're good. So my team was like, I think we're all set. I said, I've been at this a little too long to feel good about a website line. So we called the VA uh, just to double check that that was going to be true. Everyone was good, no problem, go work from home, in your yoga pants, whatever. And they said, no, actually, we're really concerned about this. Unless we have an act of Congress, not only will people lose housing, their tuition will be cut off. And so we stopped counting at about 500,000 students that would be affected. Um, and we called uh, HVAC, SVAC, we've got lovely relationships, thanks to sort of good hard work over the years. We said, 
problem uh, looking at a few hundred thousand people having their tuition and housing cut off if we don't do something today. Um, and we went from problem identified to law signed in 10 days, which um, I think would be, <laughs> I think is a really great like grad school study at some point. We'll get there. Um, but I'm, I will forever be very proud of that. It was years of relationship building that led to something we could get done very quickly to benefit a lot of people in an emergency situation. So that was a particularly fun one. Not fun in the traditional sense, but yeah. <laughs> Very impressive. You guys should have let me go first because I've been in the GR space for just over a year and I don't have any great stories. But I will tell you that one thing that was very insightful to me is that I, we, you know, I've just mentioned that WOTC bill for military spouse employment. And a number of people signed on to the legislation in the previous session. And, and I said, well, why aren't these guys signed on again? I didn't understand the scope, because I obviously didn't pay attention in high school government class. Um, I didn't understand how many bills are introduced in general, and that it's really on us to make sure that they're aware of what has come up again and what's impacting um, the families, or the, the military families and service members. So again, grassroots advocacy matters. Thanks so much, Jen, and Lauren, and Alex. Lauren knows what's question I'm going to ask. Um, my name is Carrie Ann. I'm actually the new development director for Hill Vets. Hello. But in my previous life, I actually worked for the Commonwealth of Virginia. So I know um, if, Lauren, you can talk about how you have worked with states, and the rest of you can talk about how you partner not just at the federal level, but with state governments to ensure the states who are actually the ones dispersing a lot of these um, veteran benefits, how you work with them and build coalitions. Yeah, so um, I will, I'm going to step out of my SVA hat for one minute because my work with the state, or Commonwealth, if you will, is actually not uh, associated with SVA, but um, just from being Lauren the veteran who happens to also be a lifelong Virginia resident. So I will step into that, that role for a minute. Virginia has a really great example of how the state is engaging with veterans and veteran leaders in particular to make sure that legislation and benefits are meeting the needs of the veterans in the state and then also um, the voices of veterans are a part of decision making across all levels of the state government. So there is something called the Joint Leadership Council of Veteran Service Organizations. They meet quarterly and the role of the JLC is to identify policy needs for the veterans of Virginia, put forth recommendations to the state and then go advocate for those bills uh, every year in Richmond. And it has led to some really monumental changes in the state. A few years ago, Virginia was the number one state for veterans in the country. We've since slipped a few spots, but hopefully we can get our, our ranking back up there. Um, and that is thanks to the good work of JLC and advocates, um, like Carrie in your previous role, um, making sure that that conversation is going from advocate to decision maker to governor. Uh, and it was it's really an interesting model that I think other states could learn from. At, at MOA, we have chapters and councils um, in every state, uh, and they work at the state level on, they always ask for our support and we kind of um, do what we can, but it's really the onus is on the states to work um, at their level. And at, from MOA headquarters, we work closely with the Defense State Liaison Office that tries to develop those interstate compacts that govern um, spouses transferring across state lines with license or credentialed fields. Um, and then also some like the advanced enrollment for military kids and things like that. And so Wounded Warrior Project, we don't, have uh, chapters uh, or posts um, like a lot of VSOs do, but we do have warriors across the country and we do have offices uh, and teammates across the country that interact with them every day. Um, we would like to build uh, more uh, grassroots uh, advocacy and have uh, teammates across the country who are engaging at the state level, I think, as well. Uh, right now, it's uh, mostly engaging from the federal level about federal issues, but uh, we're certainly thinking in that direction because it is very important. So more to come on that. <laughs> I can add a quick answer from the SBA hat as well. So we have, uh, we similarly, we have chapters everywhere, but um, we are not set up in the same way that VFW or Legion uh, may be with grassroots advocacy abilities, but we do have something called the Policy Liaison Program, and it takes uh, students who want to be engaged in policy and provide sort of a hands-on learning opportunity to understand how advocacy works, particularly at the campus and state level, and then empowers them to do their own advocacy. So if you are interested or know a student interested, we welcome you to the PLP program anytime. Yusuf Enriquez, uh, Lee Cord 6. Um, thanks for uh, the discussion. Um, entrepreneurship, um, that's a big thing now for a lot of veterans that are not able to do the 9 to 5 hustle and bustle. Um, 
What are you guys positioned on? One, seems like we, uh, when I was going through advanced education, you know, so GI Bill and post 9-11 kind of helps you get to that first degree. But then I felt like uh, I had to like, like fight for additional benefits that I thought was available through the Yellow Ribbon program to some of the degree master's level degree program that's a little bit more expensive that are not at the state level. Uh, and then on the entrepreneurship side, are you guys embracing a lot more veterans that are not looking to go through the traditional uh, academic route but need support in starting their own small businesses? I can really only speak to the spouse entrepreneur stuff. I, I know that there are um, service disabled uh, benef or there's service disabled small businesses um, or veteran owned, excuse me, and then service disabled. There's two different categories that give preference to small businesses if you're an entrepreneur and you're service disabled for government contracting. There are um, monetary resources if you want to start up your own company through SBA. As far as the, the spouse entrepreneur, that is, it's a great opportunity for military spouses who have to move to take that job that they've created for themselves with them. Um, and so we are working on le uh, legislation that would impact that. In fact, in this year's NDAA, at least in the House version, there's a program that would allow license reimbursement to be given for business-related costs as well as um, moving those, those business items. So I can look, I'll, get your, I'll give you my card and we'll chat later about the, the veteran entrepreneurship stuff. Yeah, and in terms of sort of multiple degrees and how, you know, I'm in grad school myself, so completely appreciate that grad school is much more expensive than undergrad. Um, you know, one of the things that we have recognized is there is a need for, for counseling on how to use the benefit. One, to know what your benefits are, right, so you better understand what is actually available to you. And then two, how to best use those benefits to meet your overall objectives, whether that be multiple degrees, whether that be one, or, or doing something, what specifically you want to do with those degrees. So the VA does have a counseling program to help uh, make that journey map for you and to help you utilize your benefits in the most um, advantageous way possible. We've also recognized there's a need for that sort of uh, counseling available and are working to, to see how we can help supplement the work of the VA and add our own touch to that need. So hopefully we'll have something soon to, to meet that gap. But you're right, there is a gap in, in that understanding and we're hoping to, to help meet that soon. And, and for Wounded Warrior Project to help with the gaps in understanding, we have a program outside of our uh, government affairs program that's called Warriors to Work. And so we really sit down with warriors who are looking for employment opportunities, and entrepreneurship is an employment opportunity. You're, you know, you're working for yourself, um, but you're employed as an entrepreneur. And so we have uh, counselors that will sit down with the warrior, try to uh, help them decide what the best track is for them, whether it be you know, federal employment, whether it be um, you know, what, you know, what different field that they want to go into, whether it be if they want to go back to school or whether it, that they want to become an entrepreneur and sit down with them and help them figure out, uh, you know, the best path forward for them. So. And on that same note, there are great programs available through the Institute for Veteran and Military Families, IVMF through Syracuse, whether that's Boots to Business or um, I think they do VYs, which is specifically targeting female veterans. Um, those are great programs, and, and I think they, they run year-round. Well, with that, I think we, uh, we're out of time, but uh, really appreciate your audience today.